we know morality percolates upward from biological layer into the social layer into the intellectual layer based on play as we discussed last time like the evolutionary biologist laid that out so the circumstances the organism faces kind of dictate what morality it, it adopts you know the morality becomes a, a tool effectively so if inorganic patterns can influence biological patterns, biological patterns of play influence moral patterns, then is this describing some chain that the, the inorganic world can actually influence our value, the development of our value systems? And where Persig talks about this in the text is when he's talking about the American, the Native Americans. And one line he said, he said they were... Uh, he said they are plain spoken. They were speaking in the language of the plains. So it was, my question is, is that how, say, the open land of the new world influenced this cultural predilection towards freedom? Like the wide open plains, the spaciousness of existence, instilling a reverence for freedom, maybe in clear cut language because you need very clear cut language when you're dealing with a wide open space, you can't be ambiguous. You need to, you know, give precise directional wording. And so does that then what I'm trying to get to is the open, wide open, free living of the plains dwelling native American, does that then percolate into this love for freedom and plain spokenness? That then becomes a value system that intertwined itself with European values to create American values. <laughs> okay, so you just sent like a cascade of different uh, things there that that my head is like is is like trying to get my head around. So okay, so there's three. There's a couple of different things here that I think we should separate and we should go through them one by one because they're all super important. Mm -hmm. um, the first one that, that set the domino rolling for me was when you made the observation that inorganic patterns of value are the soil from which biological patterns of value emerge. So, yes. so it's only, it's, it's merely a, um, let's say, a bias that makes uh, us think that biological entities are discrete from the inorganic world in which they emerge. But yes. what you're implying, and, and, I, and, and I think you're absolutely right, is that the inorganic patterns of values are influencing and affecting the biological patterns in the same way that the biological patterns are affecting the social patterns because they're the soil they're the soil in which the seed of the, the next layer grows yes which is amazing and we'll come back to it in the context of the native americans mm -hmm. specifically in how they conceptualize their relationship to the environment mm -hmm. which would be the same in, a, in, in a different terminology in piercing's terminology would be the same as saying that the native americans their biological and social patterns uh, were never seen as being separate from the environmental patterns. So they would actually personify all environmental events as being character-based. So they wouldn't mm. say the wind is blowing like we would. They wouldn't say, oh, very bad weather today. They would say the, wind's, the wind is speaking strongly today. Mm. Yeah, yeah. The implication being that there is meaning in the wind, there is yes. meaning in the blowing grass, there is meaning in the weather, there is meaning in the flowing water. Mm -hmm. They were looking, they were looking at the universe as if it was, as if it was um, acting. Right. The implication conscious. being it was yeah. consciously acting and the action itself was a way of communicating. It was an yes. exchange, yes. which like we mentioned previously, God in Sanskrit means good, Good means to exchange. Yes. So what the Native Americans looked at was they saw the environmental cues as being an exchange of information, an action that was intended to inspire communication with them. Yes. In the same way, they, they also saw that in dreams. Mm -hmm. And that makes me think that dreams, if we use the, the, the concept of heaven and earth, heaven being dynamic quality, which is the disembodied uh, ethereal realm mm -hmm. and like you mentioned earth being static quality which mm -hmm. is the aspects of dynamic quality that we've codified into the physical environment yes 
that would mean <clears throat> that the dreams are the, the, the domain on the, let's say if we, if we chart it hierarchically, dreams are the, the realm from above, which mm-hmm. is the, the guiding light that guides, that guides static quality forward. Yes. And the environment is, is at the base level of that. So it's two ends of the spectrum. The question is, and this is this is where we won't go there now because this is where we go into the concept of time, mm-hmm. which is such a big subject. But mm-hmm. I think you making that connection makes me feel like this is the Ouroboros, mm-hmm. which is it's heaven and earth eating each other. Mm-hmm. That the dreams that come from the, the realm of dynamic quality or heaven mm-hmm. and the messages that come from the physical representations of earth, right? Are somehow in a they're in a feedback loop. Yes. Which would, which would justify why Native Americans interpreted their dreams and interpreted the messages from the environment as being synonymous. They didn't make and life is the intermediary layer. The biosocial layers intermediate between inorganic and intellectual. Because that's the other thing is earth is inorganic, heaven's intellectual, life is in between and the biosocial layers. Yes, and, and we, for all, we might it might be the case that intellectual is, is the latest of multiple dimensions that are in between us and dynamic quality. Conceptually, mm-hmm. dynamic quality isn't, isn't actually the layer that it manifests as, right? So it's- Right, it's not even it, a layer, really. It's the- It's the guiding principle that creates the layer. Yeah, and it's the ineffable, right? It's the, it is the, the source of all, really probably the source of entropy in the universe, frankly, because it's it's- unlimited change right that's why it can never be put in a box or defined Uh, i've always loved the quote the map is not the territory so it's all of these things we were describing are attempting to map themselves onto the territory of dynamic quality but dynamic quality is infinitely very uh infinite variation Yes, so, yes, yes, yes. So that's evolution, actually, is that these these uh, more stable patterns are trying to map themselves for fitness onto this infinitely, in the yes. source of infinite variation. Yeah, and you said something in one of the previous um, recordings that you were talking about Plato's cave and the idea of the shadows on the wall mm-hmm. being not, not the reality itself, but right. uh, somehow... Inflections a, of truth inflections of truth and in some sense i was thinking that one of the words that came up in my mind yesterday when i'm thinking about this was that um that the shadows are derivatives they're derived from the truth but the truth itself can never be attained dynamic quality is unattainable undefinable which is why all of the the religions talk about the concept that and i think we've misinterpreted this through the left hemispheric trait of the western world when Islam says something like, uh, you cannot, well, what is it? You cannot visualize Allah. Um, we've somehow interpreted or twisted that into being an order or a threat. Mm. When in actual fact, uh, I think it, it's just a completely passive yes. statement of, yeah, go ahead and try. You're not yeah, going to yeah, do yeah, it. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> right, 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 right. Yeah. But we've, we've turned it into this idea that it means if you do, we're going to punish you. But it, yes. That, that's and, a human interpretation. But what, what it actually means is you can't. You just you can't. Can, you, you can't, can't do it. Yeah. It. We're, you, can't we're, do it. you can derive it, something from it. You can make a the, derivative, but you can't make it. Yes. The limited is incapable of conceiving the limitless. And this also, this calls to mind the Trinitarian formula in Judeo uh, Judeo-Christian Trinitarian, Trinitarian formula that shows God in the middle, the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. And it says, you know, Father is not the Son, Son is not the Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost is not the Father, but they all are God. Like, so God is all three. So you can't, we can't even, and that maybe gets into triptychs a little bit where we can't see the totality of this of dynamic quality of this, this, um, this layer of limitless variation, but we can see aspects of it. You know, you can see the father is the structure. The son is this exploratory impulse or the Holy ghost is the, I don't know, the intermediating layer perhaps. Um, and this also, one of the things this calls to mind as you mentioned, inflections of truth. I got this from uh, the interview with Joseph Campbell called, I think it's on Netflix. It's a six-part interview series. Um, 
the power of myth, I believe is what this documentary series is yeah, called. With Bill, with Bill, Mo- Bill Moyers. Bill Moyers, that's right, interviewing him. It's an excellent series. I especially recommend the final episode that I think this came from. He describes the, oh, I hope I can remember the name of it now. It's the four-sided element, maybe. I might be naming it wrong, but it's, it's A-U-M. Om. So you've seen people meditate, perhaps. Om. And what he's the point he makes here is that that sound is the primordial sound of the universe. So if you say it fully and correctly, you say ah, oh, m. And in that sound, that a u m, it contains all of the vowels of language and that all uh consonants then are just inflection point inflections of the vowels that create all of language so that single sound contains within it all of the uh all of language effectively you can derive all of language from one sound so you're just talking about these shadows are derivative of actual truth and then but the the thing is it's like okay it's a u m but it's called the four-sided element. I I think that name is wrong. It's four-sided something. Um, What's the fourth, right? You've only got A, U, and M. And it's the silence from which it is born, which it diverges into into which it returns. So it's like this, the infinite silence almost is the dynamic quality. It's, you can't even conceive it, but it's the source of all things. God damn, well, it's interesting. I just said God damn, which is fitting. <laughs> um, God, so the, the Sanskrit root of God, which is gut, G-H-U-T, yeah. its primary meanings are to exchange or to barter. Yeah. And its other primary meaning is to return. Mm, and yeah. when you put it into that context, that the, the limited yes. emerges from and returns to the limitless. The limitless. And the way of the Tao is in reversal, they say. Yeah. So... Okay. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, at some point we're going to have to segue into, a, um, John Wheeler's theories of the participatory universe and, and the one electron universe, which, yeah. which is, it's a whole different thing. And I, I don't know enough about it to talk about it, but studying it a little bit speaks to a lot of these Tao concepts yes. in quantum physics yes. and that, that, you know, when, when these things overlap in ways that, that come from two different directions, but, uh, you know, reach the same conclusion. Yes. It's, when things get pretty pretty exciting yeah, yeah what um but what's the word for that conciliatory maybe uh consilience i'm not sure that's, that's i think it's what i think it's my when, logos um, library you get the same conclusion at different levels of analysis like the more levels oh. of analysis you can get pointing in one common direction the more of an indicator that is there's something there peterson talks about multivariate analysis in, in, in the, the sphere of psychology where they do something similar, but it's, it, yeah. it's broader than just psychology. I think the term is consilience, but you're wrong. So there was something uh, going back to the, the stream of, um, of let's say stream of consciousness that you were, you were talking about. You were talking about the, the Native Americans, the concept of freedom and the concept of the inorganic patterns of value in the environment. Mm-hmm. Um, and there was another thread that, that, that while you were speaking that it, it tugged upon, which was you were talking about the, and I, I think this is more of a, a term, terminology thing, but we tend to think of the word moral and morality being a social set of rules. Mm-hmm. And, and we'll probably need to clarify this because Piercing uses the word morality to be all encompassing for every tier of action. Right. So, so his, his conclusion in the metaphysics of quality, metaphysics of quality is that all action when conducted at the various levels of evolution are in themselves subjectively moral for that level. So for example, it is moral for a virus to try and um, survive yes. because it's, it's a pattern of value. It's a pattern of life. Yes. It is also moral for a doctor to prioritize a more complex organism by sacrificing the virus to protect the organism, which is more evolutionarily complex because evolutionary complexity is 
the index of morality. Right. So you want to, to you know, and it, it become, this is where the morality becomes rational, where you can look at it and say, of course it's moral for a doctor to kill a disease, even though he's killing life. To save a patient. To save a patient. Yes. And obviously as, as, the, um, as the distance between, uh, you know, the, the subject and it's, you know, the protagonist and the antagonist in any of those, uh, let's say, decisions becomes closer together evolutionarily. It's it becomes more, more of it's more complicated. Yes. It's more of a difficult. Yeah, you know, we have to we have to try and pass it and try and yeah. make sense of it because it's difficult. Yeah. Which is where we get like the like the trolley problem paradox, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, which isn't so much a paradox of morality. It's more a paradox of explain of of demonstrating um, how different levels of your psyche are in conflict over an action. Yes. Um, are you familiar with the trolley problem? Uh, it's essentially where you have to decide between running over this group of people or that or a, a baby or something, right? So there's lots of different variations on this, yeah. but the idea is there's a single track with a, with a, with a, with a carriage that's completely lost control and it's going down the, the tracks. And when at some point down the tracks, you know, it's going downhill, there's a fork in the tracks and down one set of tracks is four people tied to the, uh, yeah. to, to the rails and they're going to get killed. And then the alternate track, which if you pull a lever, you can turn the train's trajectory so that it goes down the other track, mm -hmm. only has one person. Mm -hmm. So when you ask somebody, um, would you pull the lever to save three lives? It's a no brainer. Mm -hmm. Just go, yeah, of mm -hmm. course, like it, mm -hmm. it makes moral sense. I'll pull the lever and I'll save three lives and one person will be sacrificed. Yeah. Because the neocortex does the calculation and it's not in conflict with this, the social or the, yes. the biological patterns. Yeah. But where the test gets complicated, is when you remove the lever and you say you're stood next to the tracks mm -hmm. and in front of you is a human being and you need to push them onto the tracks to divert the train mm. and that will save the three people mm -hmm. the outcome is identical but the second experiment involves you pushing physically right. someone to their death yes and it changes the outcome of the decision because it means that the neocortex rational decision making is in competition with a biological or a, or a limbic system mm. imperative, which is to never harm somebody yeah. because you have empathy for them. Yeah. So when you when you're pulling a lever, your empathy uh, systems don't come online. When you're right. pushing a human body into the tracks, empathy kicks in. Wow. And that's where and paradox, the paradox, and this is a, I, it was only reading piercing that I realized what paradox is. Paradox is when different levels of value are looking at the same problem with different let's say variables and what they consider to be a valuable outcome mm. the, the limbic system all it wants to do is preserve harmony in a community the mm. biological system all it wants to do is survive and the yeah. neocortex all it wants to do is come up with idealistic outcomes mm -hmm. paradoxes are when a problem is provided that the three areas the three values of path the three patterns of value have a disagreement over mm. your internal structures are having competition over what they believe is the moral outcome because they all have different moral um, imperatives. Right. So you'd say a moral paradox is that conflict because I'm, I'm thinking of a, yes. another paradox that would be maybe purely intellectual, like the grandfather paradox of time travel. So what could you explain the ground? So as you can't, it basically disproves being able to travel backwards in time, because if you could go backwards in time, you could kill your own grandfather. You would never be born to go back in time to kill your own grandfather. Right. So I think I, I was think just saying that, that it, paradox can be purely intellectual, I think, as well, not just moral. When the outcome, no matter what outcome comes out, it's not perfect. Right. And that imperfection isn't a byproduct of logical imperfection. Yes. It's a byproduct that within you are different forces that want different outcomes for different, gotcha. different reasons. Yeah. yeah. And it, it also occurred to me today that the idea of rationality isn't a neocortex uh, concept. Mm. It's a meta concept. Ratio mm -hmm. is what ratio of your internal, uh, let's say uh. patterns, are you considering in the problem? 
Somebody gotcha. who is rational yes. can, can be rationally angry. They can be rationally emotional. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, you know, if, if you're in a life or death situation, it is highly rational to lose your shit. Yeah. Right. If it's going to lead to saving a child from a burning yes. building, for example, yeah, or, yeah. or so rationality isn't, isn't a, a, a cold intellectual, a cold it's intellectual. survivability almost. I mean, yeah. Rationality is the pragmatic utilization of whatever psychological um, u- u- utilities you have at your disposal. It's about right. selecting who you're going to deploy from your internal psyche. You're going to deploy right. the, the warrior, the magician, the lover. Yes, yes, yes. Rationality is knowing when to deploy the right member of your psyche to act. Right. Interesting. And that's what, and I think that's where the idea of the kingdom comes from. Meta, meta psychologically, the kingdom, you're, you are a kingdom because inside of you is these, let's say different um, regions or mm-hmm. different nations that have different value systems. Yeah. So your, your, your limbic system, which is social patterns, has a set of values that it thinks are important. Your neocortex, which is your intellectual patterns, has a different framework for what's important mm-hmm. and valuable. And your biological system is a nation. You know, if you had to embody it, the, the biological nation would be filled with horny monkeys. Yep. You know, you're in a you're in a monkey that wants to eat chocolate, yeah. bang, you know, f- f- swing around in the trees. But yeah. then, you know, if you had to embody the the, the limbic system, it would be more like a, a responsible father figure. Mm-hmm. If you had to embody the intellectual system, the neocortex, it would come as a scientist or, a, like or a the, the architect in the matrix or something. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And, really though, awesome. and, and this is, and this is where we get back to the archetypes because mm-hmm. the archetypes are the manifestation of those values being represented in culturally understandable imagery. Mm. So let's take the raw archetype of the intellectual system, which would be the neocortex yeah. um, in different stories in the matrix. It would be the architect but yeah. in Lord of the Rings. It's a wise wizard. Mm. they yeah. both understand the architecture of the system at a high level yes but they rep they're both archetypally the the magician right uh, they're represented in different forms but they're the same archetype yeah, they represent yeah, yeah, yeah. The same functionality right and this is this is where you know from my me coming from story and film yes my job is to identify the hidden architecture of characters in different genres and say well this guy represents this this guy represents that yes you know, so and, and that's necessary for the audience to resonate with the narrative. Exactly, right? you, you have to pluck those archetypal strings in the mind of your audience. Exactly, because what what you're actually doing is providing a um, let's say an amalgamated pattern of values that will reflect their own internal psyche and mm. and and pull those strings that get yes. them going. And without that range of archetypes, there are entire regions of the of the, the psyche that are being left unstimulated right. and uninvolved. Yeah. And the best stories, the, the classics, are the stories that activate the entire psyche into a harmonious uh, symphony. Yeah. And they start with all of those areas, those those let's say nations being in in discord. Yes. By the end of the story, you've been given a metaphorical, let's say, operations manual told through myth. Yeah, by which some form of atonement is reached, some form of right, redemption, right, right. and that's what the satisfaction of a good story is: is the moment when all the nations feel like they have a pact between each other that is mutually yeah. beneficial. So the so <clears throat> the archetypes, and I think Peterson agrees here too that they are physical; they exist physically, neuro. Uh, neurophysiologically almost like a blueprint that's in most people's mind but then my question would be is it if we know that the pat inorganic patterns are shaping biological biological social social intellectual does that mean that these archetypes are somehow more fundamental than biological are we be, are they derived from the universe or something in a really deep way yeah and that's where when you spoke, like, we've gone on, we've, we're, we're going all, all sorts of, of tangents <laughs> here, but going back to the original, let's say, start point of this conversation, you you made the observation that there's no real logical reason why the inorganic patterns aren't intrinsically a part of the higher three levels that we consider to be, uh, let's say, conscious beings, which is I don't bodies. see how they can't be. They, could... they can't be. So they're, yeah. they're, they are all the same thing. And, and it's, it's funny when you put it in that way, 
if I'm working on a script or if I'm um, providing production design for a filmmaker, uh, it's not just the actions of the characters that communicate to the psyche. Mm -hmm. It's the setting, it's the environment, uh, it's the lighting, right. it's the weather. Yes. You know, and, and it changes everything. If you, if you were to take like classic moments from cinema and you were to change the weather conditions or the setting or the, right. let's say the prompts, like the, the big thing with production design is that we carefully tailor associations subliminally yes. that the audience isn't aware you know, so for example, you know, there's a there's always a difference between the logical constitution of what a set should be versus the the symbolic. Mm -hmm. So the, a really simple example would be, you know, say Silence of the Lambs. Mm -hmm. There is no prison in America that involves going down steps into a subterranean dungeon that's filled mm -hmm. with like mm -hmm. medieval style castle stones. Yeah. All of that is about eliciting associations that give drama, <laughs> yeah. and they're archetypal associations. It's the associate. It's the associations that bring um, other ideas into the psyche, it's because the environment itself is a character. Yes. And what is a character? A character is someone that makes actions, that has mm, intentions. Yeah. The environment has actions and intentions right. in a story. Yeah. And of course that reverb that reverberates in the psyche because the, what the Native Americans grasped, the environment is speaking to you. Yes. It's sending you messages. And you know, and we that's what synchronicity is. That in, you know, you have those moments where something important happens and then the weather changes and it feels somehow apt, you know? Right. You know, right. That, that seems fitting. Yeah. And the question is, you don't know what you don't know what level of consciousness is influencing that weather change yes. outside of, of our perceptions. Yeah. Um, what was the example you gave about on this topic, the, the massage and the red, the red blood. Cells? Oh yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I, I'll try and I'll try and, I'll try and make sense of it. So, so in Piercing's book, there's the concept of, he, he talks as a, as a, as a kind of example of, how naive we as humans are hubristic mm -hmm. in our belief that we are the highest level of consciousness. So, mm -hmm. and he uses the example that, you know, two people walking down, um, you know, a, a major, you know, uh, avenue in New York would look up at the buildings and look around and they would, they would turn to each other and go, isn't it just amazing that, you know, we're the top level of consciousness in this whole universe. Like we've, we've reached the top, look at us, we're in New York, mm -hmm. we understand everything. And you know they look at the weather conditions and they, they don't think that it's important. They think the weather's irrelevant. They're the top conscious level and they're at the peak, the pinnacle <laughs> yeah. of the pyramid. Yeah. But like, and and that actually, you know, because we 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 have a tendency, we've been conditioned to believe that because we don't have religion anymore. We're not humble. We, you know, mm -hmm. the left hemisphere has basically yeah. concluded we are scientific beings. We know everything. Yes. We're, we're you know we're <laughs> we're top dogs. Yeah. Now, now transfer that situation and assume that two red blood cells have similar levels of let's say capacity to communicate with each other and self-reflect and they're going down an artery down the you know let's say a a, a major avenue in your leg like a major mm -hmm. artery down towards like you know the, the leg muscles and they're just conversing and they're like, look around this is the this is the pinnacle of, of consciousness <laughs> like and all they're seeing is like you know like a blood vessel wall yeah. but that for them is like advanced like that's that's top stuff yeah now when i was doing crossfit in miami a few weeks ago um i was thinking I, I went to get a physio massage because my calf muscles were all messed up and while the guy while the guy was like attacking my calf muscles and i was in physical pain at the higher level consciousness of let's say all of the cells at, at, the, at the biological level were sending signals to the higher level of my consciousness mm. saying yeah this isn't fun you know, there, was like <laughs> a, there was like an emergent property coming through that yeah. i was experiencing emotionally and then i thought to myself there's a parallel here to two people walking down new york city and two blood cells going through my calf muscle which is that two people in new york city would go through a cycle every day of their lives they would come into the city they would come out of the city they would go to their workplace they would provide a service or a utility, mm -hmm. then they would leave their workplace, go back to their home to regenerate themselves, get some sleep, and then go back to the next day and do the same thing. Mm -hmm. But across the course of an annual year, like an, you know, an annual cycle, they would see seemingly 
um, chaotic but predictable patterns that at mm -hmm. some points during the year there would be a storm mm -hmm. and that storm would have lightning and thunder and it would be relatively traumatic and it would be it would affect them as units inside of that that cycle going mm -hmm. through daily life in, in a city but they wouldn't attribute those weather patterns to anything conscious they would just attribute it to being well, this is just the chaos of weather yeah and this goes, this goes back to your point those aren't those aren't uh those those uh, weather conditions aren't chaos. They're actually patterns of inorganic value expressing intentional will. Mm -hmm. They have values that they're making expressions. They're in exchange mm -hmm. with themselves. Yes. But we wouldn't attribute any cause, any any consciousness to those weather patterns, even though they're cyclical. They seem to come back in cycles. We think it's just a scientific, you know, yeah. cycle. And then I thought to myself. These two red blood cells, which are like the equivalent of these characters in New York, they have a similar cycle that if we were to live a day in the life or a week in the life of these of these um, red blood cells, they would also have a daily routine, but their routine would be a different time schedule, which is that they would go through in our day, 24 hours, they would go through a day in about 30 seconds, which is going around the body. Yeah. They go to, they go to their workplace, which would be a, a muscle in the leg. Yeah. They would... They would pick up carbon dioxide and drop off oxygen. They yeah. would return home to the heart, yeah. where they would then be, uh, you know, pumped again to the lungs, where they would then pick up oxygen and drop off carbon dioxide. Yeah. So it's th they actually have their own work tempo, which is, you know, they value oxygen and mm -hmm. they don't value carbon dioxide. So they they're exchanging and they're going through the system, which yes. is like traffic. Yeah. And then one and then one day, as they you know one in one of their you know micro days. They suddenly find themselves getting to a familiar territory, but from their perspective, it's chaos. Mm -hmm. Blood pressure is increased. There's higher traffic. There's blockages in the veins. There's mm -hmm. like, they don't know what's going on, but all they know is that something weird is going on. Yeah. What they don't have any concept of is that there's like a 45 year old Latina dude on the outside <laughs> of the cell wall crushing my muscles. And this guy does that periodically in relation to my activities in the week as a higher order being. Right. So they would think of the the, the environmental factors that are governing their journey through the, the, the blood vessels. They would There would be moments in the week where the blood vessels are suddenly filled with lactic acid that they didn't expect. Yeah. Because somebody is causing a storm in that area of my body. Yeah. And their perception of it would be like weather conditions. Yes. They think it's and random, they, but they don't see the consciousness behind the veil. Yes, but yeah. they would go through that pattern so many times that if they could internalize it, they would have a calendar that would not be able to suggest causality, not, not be able to suggest conscious decisions, mm -hmm. but it would be semi-predictable because mm -hmm. let's say they're going through my body a hundred times a day and my body is going through CrossFit, you know, uh, once every two days, and then my body is going through physio massage once every five days, mm -hmm. then those red blood cells without knowing what the hell is going on outside of the body would be able to build a semi-predictable cycle, a calendar mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that would, with some degree of accuracy, be able to say, well, it's been like four or five cycles since we had a storm. Yeah. Their perception would be, it's probably likely there's going to be a storm. And what they would actually be, um, let's say, intuitively grasping is that at a higher level of consciousness, at the same time, I would be saying, God, my muscles are sore. I should probably go and get a massage. Mm. And that decision would lead to a thunderstorm inside of that calf muscle that the red mm. blood cells would experience as mere weather. Right. Yeah. So going back to the full, full circuit, the Native Americans consider themselves humbly more like red blood cells perceiving the environment as being a representation of higher order gods taking yeah. action in our domain. We right. see the environment as being a... Uh, a bunch of causal reactions of scientific uh, yeah. processes happening with no conscious deliberation and no patterns behind them. Yes. We've, we've, we've deprived them of all, uh, let's say, awe inspiring um, conscious uh, divine will. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, the, the Native Americans don't do that. They see it as being deeply meaningful. Right. And it, um, I would say the Western view is that the natural world unfolds in cold mechanistic uh if you have all of the information predictable waves or fluctuations but even that that newtonian perspective on the universe has dissolved as we've gotten into the quantum realm and we realize that 
oh wait there's nothing here really a lot of it most of most of an atom for instance is like the vast majority of it is empty space effectively and the actual position and velocity of of the subparticles of the atom subatomic particles are probabilistic even so it's not there is not this this cold this idea of little tiny pellets bouncing around and you know um creating all the outcomes we see in the world that is a 17th century intellectual model like it is completely gone but it's still because we're slow to adapt in our institutions and our cultures or there's some time lag i guess between this intellectual development and it actually the feedback right from the intellectual level back that we still think in that way um so that's really yeah and then i so then maybe i don't know if we're ready for this but describing so the american indian then is deeply influenced by this perspective and the landscape they live within and we would say that that planted this cultural predisposition towards freedom right they they very much valued their freedom their openness they they you know um hunting buffalo freely and roaming you know they're, they're nomadic many of these these tribes um they're kind of a no bullshit culture too you know like they talk about being he describes um he actually does a peyote persig describes his experience doing in a, in a peyote ceremony with some of these native americans but then he also to to bring this point home of how that value system then intersected with the European value system to form the American value system, he goes into old Westerns and he, he, he reads a scene from a Western movie and it just very much embodies the, uh, the American Indian. It's one of the, it's another one of those incredible um, aha moments where you just go, Oh God, it's self-evident. How could it that yeah. not have been clear to me before? And no one's ever um, talked about it before this that I know of. <laughs> No, no. And once you see it, it's impossible to unsee it. And he yes. talks about, you know, uh, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Yes. And they, they are not depictions of European settlers. Right. So I guess that, so the high level, the high level concept here that Pierce is describing is that America and its fundamental values did not magically appear as a byproduct of various cultures from Europe kind of having a voyage across the ocean and then suddenly you know, um, being exposed to the American landscape and then suddenly having a revolutionary view on what, what values their culture yeah. should have. And he initially was going to write this book with the American, the Native Americans being the central concept of the book. And, and, and he, he reorganizes that hierarchically where they're, they're a major factor. But what he claims, and it's, it's seemingly bulletproof, is that you can actually explain the American value system and America's contribution to the world and the American history once you identify and take into account that while the history books won't acknowledge it, the American constitution, the American values, the frontier values are not European settlers generating their own new code of conduct. Yeah. The American value system is the result of European frontiersmen heading west and being exposed to and imitating the cultural value uh, framework of the Native American. Yes. And that value framework, which is, I know, a, a subject near and dear to your heart and my, my own, is freedom. Yes. But not freedom in the sense of some lame ass jingo that you hear in a marketing slogan. It was right. at the core of their entire yeah. philosophy on existence. Yes. And I've actually got a quote here. This is from the book. Freedom, that was the topic that would drive home this whole understanding of Indians. Of all the topics his slips on Indians covered, freedom was the most important. Of all the contributions America has made to the history of the world, the idea of freedom from a social hierarchy has been the greatest. It was fought for in the American Revolution and confirmed in the Civil War. To this day, it is still the most powerful, compelling ideal holding the whole nation together. Yep. And his argument is that that concept of freedom that 
while it was a contributing component to people leaving the, let's say, the mechanistic tyranny of, of the old world, uh, it was only when they reached America and those settlers moved west that they began to learn from and see the Native Americans mm -hmm. as being this, this, this influential, um, let's say, uh, culture that mm -hmm. then affected the way that they thought, the way they felt, and that affected the way that they constructed the American ideal. Yeah. And, and Pierce, it goes, you know, even emphasizes that, that the, the manifestation of those influences can even be seen in the architecture as you head from east to west. Mm -hmm. So when you have a bunch of old, old world settlers, and I think we can cover on some sense also the importance of the central banking history here. Mm -hmm. But when you're on the east coast and you're in, you know, Cincinnati and you're down in the Hudson Bay area, the river is lined with constructions that are that are uh, synonymous with European castle culture, which is this idea of building your fort, demonstrating the security of your domain, um, having your own, you know, dominating the property and, and asserting it as yours. And this was happening with settlers from all sorts of nations in, in the, the European, from the European sector. So, you know, whether it be the Dutch or the Germans or the, you know, the, the Scandinavians or the English, but the East Coast is peppered with the value system of the people that first landed on the East Coast once the, the, the say, the, the journey was made easy. And the East Coast is peppered with people that got there and immediately planted their flag and didn't want to go any further into the frontier. They just wanted mm -hmm. to cement their ownership of the property there. So they took the, the landscape and they owned it, which is where you get you know, all these um, European callbacks to Victorian era values. Mm -hmm. and, and Piercic explains that Victorian era values are, are effectively can be summarized in the even down the to the the clothing and the furniture which is that they're all involuted monstrous involutions of, of societal rules mm -hmm. so you've got corsets for women which is the stricture of you that mm -hmm. the only thing that's moral to a victorian is is the appearance of morality Mm. but they don't have any concept of what dynamic morality is they just know that <clears throat> appearing moral appearing wealthy appearing polite appearing to have high um kind of uh social standing yeah that was their morality and this was and, imitating european aristocracy more or less yes. right yeah yes so the, the the settlers on the east coast were were perpetuating the static patterns of europe Mm. But those those frontiersmen, those those original pioneers that got to the East Coast and kept on moving west, mm -hmm. in the act of moving west dynamically towards an unknow unknowable goal, just the 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 art of freedom and exploration, as they moved west and with all the expense that came with it, they were being exposed to not only their own willpower to go that way, but they were also being exposed to to what from that period would have been the equivalent of meeting aliens. Mm -hmm. which is meeting Native Americans on the plains that weren't following any of the normal social co codes of conduct of Europe. They didn't even understand the, the codes of conduct mm -hmm. of Europe. The concepts that were so familiar to Europe didn't make any sense to a Native American. Right. And, and Piercic makes the observation that as you go further west through America, you get uh, this bleed of let's say a confluence of European values melding into the Native yes. American values, which idolizes the pursuit of freedom, of mm -hmm. being plain spoken. Yes. Which against the the kind of elocution of the Victorians, which is all right. about being spidery, polite, uh, ornamental, um, completely you know manipulative. Yes, lots of Native ornamental American. language, right? Versus ornamental. The very and, directness of the Native American. Yeah. Yes, and 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 the word that he uses is, is involution, but it's mm -hmm. a self-referential complexity yes. in a, in a in a in a fractal sense that yeah. it becomes a it becomes a farcical uh, satire of itself. Yeah. You know, when you see Downton Abbey and you see this perpetual. Yes, yes, to yes. It's class. almost a, a purposefully conspicuous display, right? Yes. Of wealth and and education and yeah. Um, uh I, I the last word escapes me but just trying to be overly sophisticated, sophisticated. yeah something yes that effect. yeah yeah and, and actually what what the what the victorians and i'm i'm english so i'm actually uh kind of very conscious of the fact that being raised in english culture there is this high priority that's given to the appearance and the the conscious um 
behavior of being polite and uh, mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. not being offensive, not being disagreeable, not being rude. Yes. You know, that that's part of the culture is follow the social rules. Right. Which is why, which is why we're also very compliant, which is why in this yes. age, as we speak now, 10th of July, the UK and the Commonwealth countries in Canada included, Australia, right. the UK, the seeds of those cultures are all built in a sense of Commonwealth compliance, that the cultural yes. framework makes them susceptible to authoritarianism. Right. Because no, no one wants to break away from what they are, what they believe to be the moral, uh, the, the majority view. Because, right. Because to say anything that's against the majority view makes you socially uh, vulnerable. Whereas a Native American had no conception of that whatsoever. It was no, like, I'm going to speak my mind. I'm going to yes. tell you, you know, tell the truth about how he sees the world. And they're also um, quick to rouse to violence even. Yes. Where it's, yes. you know, they're very, they can be disagreeable if you try to cross them in a certain way. Whereas the Victorian yeah. approach would always be diplomacy and deception to try yes. and mitigate uh, conflict. Yes. And Piercing uh, through one of the characters, which is a real person from, um, Montana University, you know, Bozeman was a guy called Dusenberry, who mm. was a who was a white, uh, you know, I think 60 year old white dude in Calgary, who was uh, deeply connected to the to the local tribes. Um, and they, you know, he was integrated into the, the Native Americans, they, they valued him, he valued them. So Dusenberry invited Piercig to go and have a, a peyote session. And then that's where Piercig, not only did he, he have a peyote experience that was let's say awakening him to to a level of reality that was you know not familiar to him Mm -hmm. but he also got to familiarize himself with uh how native americans acted and let's go Mm -hmm. this goes back to the concept of action yes the action is the representation of values Mm -hmm. when you see someone's action what you're actually being given is is effectively a a breadcrumb to their value system well it is the expression of the values. Yes. Yes. There is, so, there is nothing else, by the way. And this is a great, else. that's a great Austrian economist point. It's like all action is an expression of value. It is nothing else. Yes. And, and, and Piercig was exposed to the Native American straightforwardness, which, which we know is plain spoken. Yes. Which Piercig points out is the voice of the plains. Because they live on the plains. Yes. They live on the plains. Yeah. They live with an open sky. They live yes. with, um, and Piercig goes on to explain that when you look at the, the films that embodied 1950s culture in America, the most successful and loved films of the American culture were cowboy westerns. Mm-hmm. And then you think to yourself, where did these enigmatic, um, you know, uh, like tanned skin cowboys that were um, very stoic, quiet, mm-hmm. uh, but quick, quick to anger when necessary. Yes straightforward speaking no elocution no yes. no uh, no flattery yes where did where did that concept come from and you realize that it is an appropriation of the values that the frontiersmen respected right and what did they respect the native americans that's right cowboys are ironically and that they are native american values embodied with with trappings of of western culture yes yeah and there's this, I don't, I forget which movie um, he quotes in the book, but there is a, a scene in this movie where a guy is, I think he's trying to make a ruckus. He walks into an old Western bar, you know, with the. Yeah, the Butch Cassidy doors. and the Sundance Kid. Is it Butch yeah. Cassidy and the Sundance Kid? Makes sense. Yeah. Um, and Robert Redford comes into the story later as well. <laughs> um, they're they're having a a, um, a subtle conflict in the bar let's say right yeah. i think yeah. one guy has uh been cleaning up at cards he's been playing poker and uh defeating a lot of people so um and the response persig puts out is as an embodiment of these native american values living yeah. inside of you know inhabiting the frontier frontiersman american personality Uh, again back to this point that the american personality is a mixture of european and indian values so yeah uh so he says the voice this is from the book the voice of an unseen gambler says quote well it looks like you cleaned everybody out fella you haven't lost a hand since you got a deal there is no change in the kid's expression 
talking about uh, Butch Cassidy or talking about the Sundance kid rather. What's the secret of your success? The gambler's voice continues. It is threatening, ominous. Sundance looks down for a while as if thinking about it, then looks up unemotionally. Prayer, he says. He doesn't mean it, but he doesn't say it sarcastically either. It's a statement poised on a knife edge of ambiguity. There was a, a section that I wanted to read, but I don't have it on me, um, which is when he then goes on to take uh, an anthropological description of the Native Americans, mm -hmm. and, it, and, it, and it is a perfect representation of cowboys. And you realize yes. that you realize just how much the Sundance kid is an embodiment of the Native American values, even through the lens of anthropology. They're just like, these are, these are, cow these are Indians. They're not, they're not uh, Europeans. Hey, everybody. As you've no doubt learned by watching this show, Bitcoin is the single most important asset you can own in the 21st century. And one of the most important companies in Bitcoin today is Nidig. Nidig's mission is to get Bitcoin into the hands of as many people as possible. One of the ways they are accomplishing this mission is by empowering banks and financial technology companies to offer their own Bitcoin products and services. As a true game changer in the industry, Nidig is safely unlocking the power of Bitcoin for forward-thinking individuals and institutions alike. Led by Robbie Gutman, Yen Zhao, and Ross Stevens, Nidig has absolutely exploded onto the Bitcoin scene recently and has quickly become a leader in this space. So whether you are a professional investor looking for asset management services or a company looking to white label your own Bitcoin product or service, consider Nidig your single source solution for everything Bitcoin. I want to read this last... This is just describing the traits of the American Indian that are inhabiting Sundance Kid. It's talking about the famous old traits of the American Indian, silence, a modesty of manner, and a dangerous willingness to sudden, enormous violence. He deals with the problems of life in set ways, while at the same time showing a notable capacity to readjust to new circumstances. His thinking is rationalistic to a high degree and yet colored with mysticism. His ego is strong and not easily threatened. His superego, as manifest in the strong social conscience and mastery of his basic impulses, is powerful and dominating. He is mature, serene, and composed, secure in, all his, secure in his social position, capable of warm social relations. He has powerful anxieties, but these are channelized into institutionalized modes of collective expression with the satisfactory results. He exhibits few neurotic tendencies. And the point that he's making is that, that so that's a description of the American Indians um, personality traits. And that except for the one exception of colored with mysticism, they almost all perfectly describe Sundance Kid in that scene. Um, oh, it's 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 funny. Even the mysticism is is ambiguously uh, alluded to when he when he answers prayer. Yes, prayer. So, exactly. So even yeah. that is somehow implicitly yes. implied. It's implied. Right. Know? Yes. Um, and to, to to reinforce all of that, everything you just said, uh, there's another quote from Piercing about this matter about the let's say the acquisition of these values, and he says. One often hears frontier values spoken of as though they came from the rocks, the rivers, or the trees of the frontier. But trees, rocks, and rivers do not by themselves confer social values. Mm -hmm. They've got trees, rocks, and rivers in Europe. It was the people living among those trees, rocks, and rivers who are the source of the values of the frontier. Mm -hmm. And America is effectively, even, even the imagery of the American yes. uh, symbols of the, the, the bald eagle, these are these are the creatures that existed in the skies above the Native right. Americans. Um, so there's there's a, an unwritten um, there's an un, let's say un, unspoken connection in the American history that isn't yeah. really appreciated. Right. But it's it's the cultural revolution that came from being exposed to Native American values. That's interesting. There's there's been a few points in this book where I've thought maybe there's either some internal conflict which we can get into later, or he didn't expound upon it 
deeply enough. And I think this might be one where he's saying that the inorganic, he, he's kind of discounting the inorganic layers influence on the biological layer. It sounds to some extent, what I would argue, my, my yeah. counterpoint there would be that, yeah, sure. You have rocks and streams in Europe, but the difference the, it's the conditions of scarcity that people operate under, right? So in Europe, yes. there's going to be a lot more population density. There's going to be much more uh, of an impetus to industrialize and economize human action. Whereas the Native Americans, they had almost no scarcity, right? It was like unlimited yeah, space. Yeah, yeah. There's 300 million buffalo, um, just a different type. So it's, it's the inorganic patterns of the environment in which they inhabit influencing yeah. their character and morality yes yes and i think the variables it could just be that that the dynamic discovery of the technology that would eventually lead to the let's say the, the um agricultural revolution mm -hmm. changed the let's say the biological distribution which changed the social value system mm -hmm. because then you became you became basically um a member of a city and the native americans never actually created the technology in which to shift right. their, Sit in one their, place. Yeah. their infrastructure yeah. so they never they never went down that road they, they were effectively nomadic living off the land so had they become the agricultural state. they probably would have discounted their love for freedom too to some extent yeah. right and yeah and, and i guess you know the my my guess is that with the american landscape like you say being so broad and so epic and so large that the the absence of say scarcity in terms of land mass meant that there wasn't let's say the same conflict slash competition to to ad adapt to different modes of living that yes. was necessary in the in the european landscape which would have yeah. which would have led to the cultivation of new technologies to overcome right. the, the the scarcity of, of yes. land and also the also the geographical features the geological features are also going right. to change the motivations of action well people um, in the europe facing population density in Europe would systemize themselves to become cities, which he gets into yes. later in the talking about the giant. But I think, I think that the key takeaway from this section is that what Piercing is saying is that what instigated this discussion of cultural values was that Duesenberry had asked him to try and put scientific, um, a scientific explanation or no, to refute something that was happening in the anthropological um, process, which was that, let's say, the field of anthropology had stated unequivocally that because values, cultural values, could not be inspected and, could, uh, and they couldn't be identified or verified, they weren't real. Right. And that was because the founding kind of, let's say, father of the anthropological movement at the time was a guy called Franz Boas. And Franz Boas had come from physics, which is the study of, of inorganic patterns of value. Yeah. And what he what he had attempted to do is to transpose the the um, the discipline of studying physics onto, onto the a social of science onto social sciences, yeah. and and he had made the mistake of seeing them both as being equivalent sciences, which is exactly what Keynesians do to economics. Yes, yeah. yes, they had attempted to transpose an inappropriate um, mode of 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 inquiry. Yes, onto a system. That has completely different properties. Yes. And Franz Boas was trying to make cultural anthropology sit within the framework of right. the same disciplines as, as, as atoms. Yes. And in the act, he had literally destroyed anyone inquiring about, uh, he even said, you know, that generalizing was, was not allowed in anthropology because of this character, because generalizing meant you weren't being specific enough and you weren't right. being scientific enough. What? But all values are in culture is generalizations. And like, um, you know, and, and Piercing explains, if you can't generalize with a theory, it's no bloody use. That's what a theory is. A theory is a generalization. It's a generalization. Yeah. And, and you need to be able to generalize it yes. in order to have a, a pragmatic use case for action. Yes. So generalization is a prerequisite for right. action in right. any environment. You without, need to generalize. Without generalization, we just sit there overwhelmed by all of the reality pouring in right we have no we have no way to map the territory in any useful way yeah. yes so what so piercing's uh, obsession with the native americans was saying that anthropology is basically a useless study and it's mm -hmm. buggered up because of its obsession with subject object metaphysics it was looking for 
effectively trying to look at, you know, to use an example, it would be like trying to use an oscilloscope to inspect a magnetic hard drive in search of data. You right. never find the data. Yes. So, so the whole discipline should be scrapped. Yes. That was Pier Six's conclusion: is that yeah. this is a giant steaming turd. Right. 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 It needs right, to right. go. Uh, and and therefore the humanities need to be seen through the lens of quality and yes. values, not through scientific rationalism yes. and, and materialism. Is, yes, which is the same thing the Austrians say. It's like you cannot look at economies, which are similarly complex systems as humans. You can't look at them through an empirical lens. It doesn't work. You can't run experiments. There are no constants. Um, it has to be done deductively from axioms, right? Um, the, the, the other the, the train of thought I lost earlier that I think was pertinent to our earlier point is that the Victorians themselves, they were benefiting from all of the wealth being generated by the Industrial Revolution. So there was yes. all this new wealth pouring into them, yeah. but it was coming at such a rapid pace. They didn't know what to do with it. So they just started to emulate the static patterns of European culture. And yeah. that's why you get this gaudy, like, you know, new infamous, money, new yeah, money, new yeah. money, right? New yeah. money, emulating the patterns of old money, but in kind of a gaudy, you know, yeah. somewhat um, counterfeit way, I guess you may say. Yeah. And that's, that's the involution idea, right? Which yes. is the frac it's instead of fr moving fractally outwards yes. with the influence of an outer inspiration, like, right. like dynamic quality, you instead fractally move inwards and you, you move in on yourself, which yes. is like a, it's like an ingrowing toenail. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like an ingrown toenail. Just, and it, it's, once it's again, unnatural, hideous, and painful. <laughs> the in, the inorganic layer influencing their because it's really it's how much wealth they're so it's how much yeah control over the inorganic world they have obtained through technology. So you get yeah. that feedback loop again. The yeah, idea yeah, layer yeah. influencing how much the biological layer can control the inorganic layer. And yeah. then when they have all this newfound wealth, they don't know what to do with it. So they mold themselves after the culture that they came from into this yeah. grown toenail of yeah, yeah. Victorian Which is style. like pain, painful for the, for the, let's say the, the organism of global culture has got an ingrown toenail, which is from <laughs> that, that involuted value system of repl yeah. replicating something that's static. Yeah. Um, it's worth noting, you know, we talked about this uh, briefly before, but the, you can actually map the, the values of America as you move east to west, not just in the architecture, mm -hmm. where if you go to LA, for example, where you've got chipboard constructions, which have more influence of teepees than they do of skyscrapers in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. And that's partly, that's partly uh, the, the natural um, outcome of the, like you say, the environment, the inorganic patterns of value, because mm -hmm. on the west coast, you've got earthquakes. So you don't build concrete constructions that would collapse on themselves yeah uh, and you you know there's, there's a different goalposts for the for the architectural framework that you would use to build in both places but we talked about the fact that you actually have different um let's say cultural ideologies that govern the technological development in both uh on on both uh, sides of the country yeah in the east you have the extrapolation of this involuted new money that is referencing the old world mm -hmm, and that mm -hmm. manifests in derivative financial institutions and wall street which is taking the central bank ideology and the central the centralized financing of of, of the monarchy and europe and germany and, and the uk rent seeking yeah rent seeking yeah rent seeking trying to make money out of money out of money derivatives yeah. derived yeah. static yeah. derivative in itself is like deriving from something else yes Whereas where, as you go to the West Coast, you get the, the frontier of not just the, the frontiersman, but you also get the frontier of Silicon Valley, mm -hmm. which even the wording Silicon Valley is like moving into the frontier of the digital realm. Right. It's the new, it's the new frontier. Yeah. And in much the same way that the UK struggled desperately to try and the monarchy tried to reestablish itself in the new world of America. Yes. Now you've got the existing financial system trying to reestablish itself in the new frontier of the digital space with right. CBDCs. Well, it they're did. Cha they're it, chasing dynamic frontiersmen yes. into the new frontier. Yes, to consume the wealth that is created from freedom. Yes, right? yes, so, yeah, yeah, so, yeah. And it did successfully install itself in the United States in the form of the Federal Reserve. 
but these values then that become more freedom oriented as we go west, I think ultimately instantiated themselves in the creation of Silicon Valley and the emergence of digital space, which is the new frontier. And it's, um, you know, once again, we've radically increased our ability to exchange with one with one another, as we're proving right now on this call, you know, bending time and space with digital technology. And that has created talk again to tie this back to value. We see these this wave of interpersonal values moving west, and they get to a place uh, that is the least inhibited by any static pattern, any institutional form. And the result of that is the creation of the most valuable companies in the world today. All digital tech companies, all born on the West Coast, all uh, accelerants to free exchange. But now the static patterns, again, are attacking that landscape as well, right? Google is, they're trying to break up Google, regulate, et cetera, et cetera. So what, what was the quote you made last time that the entire sphere of being is a war between static and dynamic something like yes. that yeah and dynamic is is the pursuit of let's say the metaphysical principles of freedom mm -hmm. which is the space for sovereign action yes and in its wake as it explores uh, freedom from the mechanisms of the the raw rules of the universe yes it creates its own mechanisms to service its own freedom yeah which inadvertently become the let's say the the gloopy liquid from which they have to try and pull themselves out as they move forward because right. the static the static patterns that, that are created by that dynamic quality also want to survive and are threatened by dynamic quality moving forward so yes good which is the exchange and creation of value creates freedom yes which allows the further pursuit of freedom but simultaneously creates the evil in the systems that try to stop it from moving forward and that's right. where the quote from dark knight comes in you either die a hero or live long enough to see yourself become a villain yeah what was once a dynamic system of freedom becomes the new prison that the next step needs to iterate from i just said one more wrinkle of complexity to this to move forward even dynamic quality has like to to disrupt an industry let's say you always have to go narrow first so you actually have to attack in kind of a static way like you need something very sharp and poignant to go into a new industry and then you expand outward to disrupt. So there's this, it's just, uh, I mean, it really is yin and yang where the two are interrelated in opposition, but also in cooperation to create reality as we understand it um, at multiple layers, right? You know, organic, biological, social, intellectual. And it's crazy to look around your room right now and, and this is this is the this is the thing that's so difficult to grasp is that we're talking about these things as if they're static entities, but you are in a field of all of these patterns of value operating right now. Yes. And and Piersig would say that that what you're not you're not looking at matter because matter suggests something fixed and substance, mm -hmm. and that mm -hmm. that's actually a filter, a bias that we put on to yes. things because of the observation that they appear to be still. Right. But even the most solid quote unquote object in that room yeah. is a field of, of stable inorga inorganic patterns mm -hmm. that if played on time lapse would would demonstrate are not stable at all. They yes. are in dynamic flux at all times. Yes. Even glass. Glass is a liquid. I didn't realize this. Window yeah, glass yeah. is a liquid. Sticker at the bottom of the window pane. Yeah. 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 It's slowly seeping. It's just it's got such yeah. a high level of viscosity that it, it takes a long time to do it. Yes. But that's where the time factor comes in. Everything right. is a wave. Everything is a pattern yes. of value. And it's only later that we intellectualize it as, as, as with biases of, well, that's a still object. That's a piece of matter. Yes. But, you know, once, once you, with Aristotle saying that the world is divided into subjects and objects, once you take the metaphysics of quality and you assume that all objects have subjective action patterns, what you're actually saying is that all subjects are objects and all objects are subjects. It's an illusion to separate them in any other way, because if everything that we consider in the universe is having a, a, a value action, is valuing something and making an action, is ex and the act of, of, of acting is exchanging, yes. because it's the exchange of energy, yeah. it's the, the valuation of something, the action and the exchange in the process of action mm -hmm. with something else, 
then subjects and objects uh, are all conscious. Mm. Therefore, they're all value. And then just to hit the time-lapse lens you hit on, I think that's a great, people have, again, digital technology has allowed us to see the time-lapse lens. We've seen maybe a flower blossom and then die or, or something like that. That is what I would call is the eye of God in a way, right? When you consider reality through that low time preference vision, that is the best way to make your decisions is that these things aren't stable. I mean, the, these patterns can be stable in a moment, but they're not stable over the long term. And humans that consider that deeply and act accordingly are the ones that are most successful. So that the ones that act most in accordance with the low time preference vision of God of the world that we need to work today, not just for today, but for tomorrow and decades and centuries into the future. That's how we advance ourselves and, and bootstrap our civilization. And it's interesting that the, the pattern of value that has the lowest time preference, which is, let's say, the most timeless, is the realm of ideas and, and intellectual, yes. uh, let's say, ethical ideals yeah. and, pr and principles. Yes. And in our attempt to embody them, we instantiate them in the, in the, with inorganic patterns of value that are most low time preference too. So we cast, uh, you know, in, in marble, we cast mm -hmm, art right. and, and, and yes. statues yeah. to embody those principles, yes. knowing that, of course, all of those statues will one day perish. Yes. But, but an, an act of valuing those higher ideals is manifested by well, trying to use physical properties that will last as long as possible. And embodying those physical ideal or embodying those principles gives us the wherewithal to handle those materials, right? We, we increase the division of labor, technology improves, all of a sudden we can start constructing things out of steel or marble. So there's a feedback loop again between our ability, the more timeless the principles we're operating upon, the more capable we are of handling materials that can reflect those principles in matter. And that's like you mentioned, you know, today on, on Telegram, Heaven and earth. Heaven is dynamic quality, which is, is where the origin of new inspiration, the divine yes. invocation of, 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 of the highest possible unattainable limitlessness is, 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 is born. And earth is the static representation in, in yes. embodied that we create in, in, in the image of heaven, yes. the kingdom of heaven on earth. Right. The kingdom of heaven yes. being the domain of dynamic quality, being instantiated, ordained yes. in the physical realm. Yes. in the realm that we call physical for its brief and limited period. You know, it's the yin and the yang, right? The, li the limitless, the, if you, if you, lim you know, what is it that Peterson talks about? The one thing that something infinite doesn't have is, is limitations. That's right. Yeah. So limitations need the limitless, the limitless needs the limitations. Yeah. They're in a, they're in a reciprocal dynamic relationship right. and we are participants in that marketplace. And that is our, that is man's purpose is as the mediator between heaven and earth and, you know, lifting matter up and giving it meaning and bringing meaning down and instantiating it in earth. And in my mind, you know, there's a lot of ways to do that, but economics is the most important one. It's, well, it's, it's everything. It's the, it's the it's base everything. to do everything else. The more wealthy we become, the more artistic pursuits we can have. But you yeah. have to get wealthy first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and like you said, uh, what was it? You you mentioned the idea of um, like Mises, uh, Mises in action, and you you mentioned the idea of if you replace the word economy with God, market with God. Yeah, you can go market market with God. Replacing the word market with God in human action. And I've been reading King James Old Testament, well, King James Bible, not just Old Testament, replacing the word God with market. And it's just, and I'm not saying that God is the market. Again, people like, especially the, theologically inclined people are like, oh, that's sacrilege. It's like, no, no, no. Our highest form of worship, if God is this, this timeless principle of free exchange, or that's one like really potent aspect of what God is, our highest form of worship is to emulate that as best as possible. And in fact, if God is the creator, that makes all the sense in the world, because in a free market, we are creators. We are maximizing our creative potential through free exchange with one another. So it's just, it's it not only is like beautiful and poetic, but it's the most pragmatic thing in the world we can do. 
And, it, and, and if, if the market is the, let's say, the name of the realm of exchange, and if the Sanskrit origin of the word God is gut, which is exchange, mm -hmm. and if we look at the idea that relationships are exchange, yes. we look at the idea of the Holy Trinity, that there's not one or two or three, there's, there's the, the, the participants and the relationship between them. Yes. Then God is the market. It's the market is God realizing himself. Or it's the kingdom of heaven on earth, right? Yeah. 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 It's the marketplace, the yeah. exchange place. Yeah. And that's where it, action is. Action is about exchange and exchange in totality yes. is the market and yes. market in totality is God. Yes. And the more freedom in the marketplace, the more timeless our creations become.